I'm just going to come clean right off the top. I did not see this coming. I did not see it coming either. No one saw this one. Coming. Okay, <laughs> just making sure. Well, yeah. Typically, yeah. typically yeah. Uh, the our ecosystem, the media ecosystem, loves hot seat lists, and they'll do like medium seat lists, and right. everyone really tends to have an expectation about changes that may come. But this was a true shocker, what Wisconsin did on Sunday. It's interesting. I was saying to you, I thought a little bit on the ride home on Saturday night, a little bit about, man, that must have been really tough for Paul. And to have it happen against Brett Bielema, who, of mm -hmm. course, had coached at Wisconsin. And I did think in the back of my mind, maybe at the end of this year, that they evaluate. Yep. So, so, like, in that sense, not totally, totally shocked, but totally shocked that it happened now. It is, this is not a typical Wisconsin move. Yeah, because it's, in some ways fiscally irresponsible when you look around what's happening in college athletics because this is not the moves that they make when you, when there's money involved they normally are are playing things very close to the vest but to see paul chris leave right now is just no one saw it coming i go back to that because again that's not something that historically the university has done all right it is our big story so let's get into it a little bit again the dismissal of Paul Christ at Wisconsin, five games into his eighth year at his alma mater. He went 67 and 26, was 6 and 1 in bowl games. He won a Cotton and an Orange Bowl. But the Badgers have lost 10 of their last 23 games, including three of their first five this year, leading AD Chris McIntosh to make the change. I'm tasked with making difficult decisions about the future and of the direction of this program. And I felt at this point in time that a change was needed. I met with Coach Chris this morning. We had a long meeting. We talked about it. And um, we agreed to move on with this change and this decision. I'm optimistic that you know uh, today's the first day of, of uh, the future of this program and of the direction that we'll take it. Majority of these players, a huge determining factor in coming to Wisconsin is Coach Christ, right? So, um, very shaken with the news. I had a, a long relationship with Coach Christ as a player, um, mentoring me. You know, as I got into coaching, you know, this man hired me with zero coaching experience and, and named me his coordinator a year later. So, very emotional day for myself. Um, and with that being said, it's you know. A, a dream for myself coming out of uh, of that nightmare. Player reaction, including star linebacker Nick Herbig, who tweeted, still at a loss for words, but one thing I do know is we're playing this season for you, Coach. Love you beyond measures. And then the hashtag, presumably, play for Paul Christ. The new chancellor of the university, Jennifer Manukin, tweeting, I want to express my appreciation for Paul Christ for his seven-plus years as head coach of the UW football team. Paul always represented UW with the utmost professionalism and class. I wish him all the best in his future. Adding, I also want to thank Jim Leonard, who has a long history with UW, for his willingness to take over as interim head coach. I wish him and the team great success through the rest of the season. Hashtag on Wisconsin. Obviously, this was not easy for anyone in Madison. And kind of before we get into this, look, Howard, we, we've spent a lot of time <laughs> Yeah. around Paul Chris. That is part of what is unique, I think, to our job. Mm -hmm. He has never been anything but great right. to us. He is yeah. a super human being. And I think you can see, you could see it in Chris McIntosh. I watched the entire news conference here on the Big Ten Network last night, and you could hear it in his voice. Yeah. You could hear it in Jim Leonard's voice. No one feels good about this. Wisconsin has not fired a head coach since the late 1980s. Don Morton, that's mm -hmm. before your time, but Howard and I yeah. can vouch uh, that that needed to be done, <laughs> right? It, it, it was bad. It was it, bad. It was. I was alive. <laughs> I, checked, I checked that. Before uh, you were fortunate. You were not subjected to watching yeah. Wisconsin football at that yeah. time because it, it it was really bad. With all due respect yeah. to, to Don Morton, uh, why now? Why do you do this now, Howard, rather than say the end of the year if you think it's trending in the wrong direction? You know, my initial reaction is to say this really is about. It's all about Jim Leonard. But that was the wrong use of words, right? Because it's not about Jim Leonard. It's about moving the program in a different direction with the coach that you believe is already on staff that you've named the interim an opportunity to build the program. But I don't want it to seem like, okay, well, you know, Jim Leonard said this, this is what it needs to happen. And we've obviously seen his comments and he has great respect. But I think 
you look at this program right now and you see a young budding star that NFL owners and GMs salivate over, other you have to believe there are other great coaches like Nick Saban who have tried to lure him to their program. He's a hot commodity. And if you have him in your own backyard, in your building, I think you have to give him that opportunity to try to lead your program. Yeah, I think, I think that's where we we're all shocked, but then you kind of look at this, go backwards and try to piece it together of how we got here yeah. and how and why this would make sense from a decision standpoint. It's a seven-game audition for Jim Leonard. This is someone that we have not seen be a head coach. He's been one of the elite defensive coordinators in the country, but we've seen programs – you know, opt to go with a sitting head coach or look for someone with that experience because these are totally different jobs these days. You're a CEO, you're managing so much off the field and not just coordinating the side of the ball that you have that background in. So this is a seven game audition for him. And it also, again, you've seen a lot of changes at power five levels already through the first five weeks of the season. It signals that you're in the market. If you do want to do a national search, if it doesn't work out for whatever reason with Jim Leonard, you are in the market as well as another big, t big 10 West team in Nebraska that you might be competing for with similar candidates. But I think the key thing here is you have Jim Leonard. This is someone a lot of people thought could be the next head coach of Wisconsin. Here's seven weeks to see what that looks yeah. like. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be an easy transition. I mean, that's where it's hard. But 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 I think that the if you're sitting there and you're Chris McIntosh and you've got Jim Leonard there and you mm -hmm. say to yourself, this could be our next guy. Mm -hmm. But what if it isn't? Like, what if it is? But what if it isn't? Right. So what if you get to the end of the year, you say this isn't heading in the right direction. We're going to yeah. give it to Jim. And what if he's not the right guy? And then you missed out an opportunity right. to go on the market. This allows you to kind of split that difference. Yeah. And to say, well, like you said, it's an audition. We get a chance to see how he does. Like, look, Brent Venables is trying to make that transition right now. It's not going great right. in Oklahoma. You don't necessarily slide over and succeed right away. So let's see how it goes. And then, oh, by the way, Lance Leipold is out there who has connections to your program. And has spent a lot of time in the state of yes, Wisconsin. Yes, from Wisconsin. Very, very yeah, successful. Absolutely. Yes. It's very interesting because these schools have been making moves earlier and earlier in these last few years. And people would point to the early signing period yep. and now the portal as reasons that you need to make a move early so you can get all of that in order and the players know who they're going to play for. But what it's done is these interim coaches are getting actual tape right like they're getting more time instead of if there's one game left in the season or a bowl game with an interim coach this is a very different scenario that we've seen unfold yeah. here when you are making changes this early one of the things that's going to be critical in my opinion whether it's coach Leonard or whoever the next coach is there is how you build your back office and what I mean by that I'm talking about your recruiting department I'm talking about NIL that's a part of it as well you're talking about what you have to do as far as the portal if you look at some of the programs right now in the back office, the guys that are not are non-coaching positions, they are huge. Are the Badgers willing to go in that direction? Does Jim Leonard want to go in that direction? Because I, I promise you, whoever the next coach is, is going in that direction. And the Badgers, as an institution, have to want to embrace that. And to me, making a move like this says that you're willing to embrace some of the changes that may need to come in the back office because you made the move now. You saw the picture. Is it Florida, right? The staff compared to like the 70s or 80s, and yeah. you just see how many people and non-players are on mm -hmm. these these places. It, it does take a lot of that, and and just sort of the reality of what it takes to win in 2022. It takes a lot, and and I think when you see mid-season change, especially the stunning ones, you are saying, okay, there, there's a lot of hard decisions. This is a big business, mm -hmm. and you have to make sure that you have the right people in the right spots at the right time in order to win big. And so, you know, obviously he's had an incredible amount of success at Wisconsin. Yeah. A lot of people are hurting. I mean, I think you could tell in Jim Leonard. Yeah. He seems he's shocked. Sure. I mean, Jim upset. Leonard said in the news right. conference, he hired me without any coaching yeah. experience yeah. and a year later promoted me to right. coordinator. He knows that his career, he is indebted yeah. to mm -hmm. Paul Chris. And he said that, uh, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. That's a really tough – I mean, like, someone asked – there was a question in the, the – opposed to Jim about, like, bittersweet. I mean, that's as bittersweet as it can get. Yeah. You you got your dream job. You get to be the head coach at Wisconsin, but you're doing it in a way that's not at the end of the season. The head coach didn't mm -hmm. get to hand it off to you. I mean, it's just – that's not ideal. Yeah. I, I want to go back to 67 and 26. I want to go back to 6-1 and one in bowl games. I want to go back to winning two New Year's Six Bowls. I mean, he has had a ton of success. Now – the last two years, they started the season ranked and finished unranked. 
this year they were trending in that direction as well. They need to have a really good finish to, to finish ranked after starting the year ranked this year. All that being said, what does it say about how Wisconsin views itself when you fire a coach who's 41 games over 500? Yeah, well, I think it's the way they lost the games that they did this year. Um, you know, and they were certainly moving in this direction over the last couple of years, right? There had been a little bit of a drop off. They still win nine games last year. It's losing to Wazoo at home in a game that you've, you, you never lose that game. And then losing to your former coach the way that you did, they weren't in that game. They were thoroughly beat on, on in all facets of that game against Illinois. And I think that's what's what's tough because this is a team that takes so much pride in how it wins games, how it's built. Um, and, you know, all the things that we usually pencil in, great run game, great yeah. offensive line, great defense, when they don't have that, it's really noticeable. And I think that's where, like, if you're, if you're Wisconsin and you take pride in that, and, again, yeah. if you're trying to figure out maybe you're giving this to another Wisconsin guy who's going to build it in a similar way, but you just don't have those pieces that usually are your benchmarks. And I think that that was what was really tough. It's the way they lost the mm -hmm. games that they lost this season more so than the record. I, I don't think that they can continue or get back to the success that they've had in previous years building it the way they've played the last couple of years. I think this is going to take a drastic change for the next person that's in charge. I just believe that that's where they are right now, the recruiting. They recruit differently yep. up there. They, they have some other challenges that some schools in this conference, you know, don't have um, as far as it, uh, admission. And I just think that the recruiting department has to change. Uh, I think a lot of things have to change to get the program back to where I think they want to be as far as being a championship program. And that's what makes this decision hard, but also means, okay, I can see it. Let's make the move right now so we can correct. And, you know, you think about what do coaches do to try to make these changes. You change your offensive coordinator. You you're, you're spend the offseason saying, like, we're going to see growth in this and we're going to see growth in this area. Um, and, and you don't have that. And so, you know, that's going to be a key factor of whoever becomes the full-time head coach is, is that offensive side of the ball. How, how do you maximize that? And, and in an NIL, in the transfer portal era, how do you become an attractive destination? So if you do have – holes or weaknesses in any part on that offense, let's say in particular, mm -hmm. how do you get guys to come right away? Because that's going to be also an important piece for the head coach. That'll be really important. I'd say something else that would be really important too. They have some significant, significant challenges when it comes to facility because they're landlocked. Yeah, I where mean, they are. The, the indoor is yeah. nothing to write home about. No, but yeah. they do, listen, and, and they've done everything that they can Absolutely. do as far as upgrading yep. what's there right now. But the reality is you don't have a 100-yard grass field to practice yeah. on. Yeah. You don't have some other alternatives. So they've always been in, in the stadium. So it'll be interesting to hear what type of changes they want to if they can do some of those things. But again, this is a program that's been successful with those challenges. That's right? the whole thing, right, is that they seem to – they have figured out, they have so clearly identified who they are mm -hmm. and what their niche is, and they've been unbelievably good at it. And I think it has become kind of a badge of honor that, hey, we're not all about all the flashy Bills, things, whistles, yeah, right? All that, right? right? We're about good, solid coaching. We're about being an unbelievable developmental program. Mm -hmm. And all of those things they have done, and they have done – incredibly well. I think you could argue they've done it as well as any program in America. No, no doubt. That is kind of of their ilk, right? I mean, they, they've had 20 straight winning seasons. It's one of the three longest streaks in the country. Year in and year out, you depend on Wisconsin football being good. Okay, so now Jim Leonard does get this audition. He starts with Northwestern and Michigan State, which feel like two pretty winnable games. In fact, I think if you look through the rest of the schedule, it lays out pretty well to make a decent run here, kind of what now for the Badgers? Well, you want to see growth. You want to see improvement in, in different areas. I don't think you, need, you expect anyone to go undefeated with, with an interim head coach. Mm -hmm. But I think you, you want to see um, there, there's we've, – we've identified a lot of the different weaknesses, right, of, of how they've had this year. Mm -hmm. What can you shore up? What can you fix? I mean, we've had the same conversation with Nebraska. What can you do from a staffing perspective mm -hmm. to change things or scheme things? Um, so look for that. And then and to your point earlier – Jim Leonard, does he want to be a head coach? Does he want to do all of the off-the-field stuff? I mean, we're going to see him do weekly press conferences and talk to the game broadcast crews and do all sorts of fundraising events and all these things that he has never done as the head coach. So you're also auditioning all of the off-the-field, off-the-game plan stuff. And to add to that, oh, boy, by the way, and I'm not saying he doesn't do this already, 
but you now have to make yourself available to the guys on the offensive side of the field. You have to get to know the players on that side of the field. And it's easier when you're the defensive coordinator and you know some of the younger offensive players because they're running scout team for you. But now you're talking about getting to know the starters, getting to know some of the other players and what makes them tick. Being a head coach, and we've got several here when we have a chance to talk about this with Coach Donato, that's one of the most difficult things to be able to do, manage your time just with your players, let alone all the outside things that you need to deal with as far as the media and as far as interact, interfacing with the campus. There are a lot of things that go into being a head coach. And let's be honest, the defense hasn't been great these last couple of games, right? I mean, they got run over by Ohio State. Illinois had its way with them. It wasn't 500 yards or anything, but certainly yeah. Illinois comfortably move the ball. And so Jim's got to feel like I've got a few things I've got to work out right. on my okay. defense, right? Yeah. I've got some challenges on my side of the ball. I, I think we all believe they'll be really good. Ultimately, he, he runs a great defense, but he's got to work on that. And now he's got to do all this other stuff. And too. figure out, you know, what can you do defensively when yeah. you are the head coach, right? I mean, I think he got asked this, but it was also sudden on Sunday night yeah. of, you know, are you going to call plays? Or right. how are, you know, yeah. <laughs> he was saying, I'll be super involved in the game plan. Like, I can't think about the rest of this right I, now. I found so out about this two hours ago, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. they have to figure that out, though, too, because yeah. you do have like a well oiled machine and a system with someone as a defense coordinator. How much can you actually do while also being the head coach? Bobby Ingram position has also just elevated, right? Because now he's going to need to be the one that's going to make some of those plays third and one, fourth and one. You know, those are things that they both have to be able to, to, to walk through and talk about because now as a defensive coordinator, you don't really worry about so much of the game management side of it. Now as the head coach, he has to worry about it, and now he has to lean on his offensive assistants as well to be able to make a lot of those decisions uh, go the right direction. Ton more to talk about on this, and that's the beauty <laughs> of having a show each and every day. We'll, we'll get to it as the week progresses. Certainly a fascinating day, and you'll get to see the first iteration of that Wisconsin team under Jim Leonard right here on the Big Ten Network on Saturday, part of a triple header. We kick things off with a very compelling game between Purdue and Maryland. Then it's the Badgers and Wildcats, followed by a primetime clash between Iowa and Illinois. What a lineup. Starts with Big Ten tailgate Saturday, only on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. was the scene in the visitors locker room in Madison as Brett Bielema went back to his old stomping grounds and got a win for the fighting Illini against Wisconsin first time they had won there since 2002. I just want to come out and say it. I think Illinois is legit. I don't see any reason Howard why this cannot be the team that ends up representing the West in Indy. I'm not saying it's going to happen right. but I'm saying they have all the pieces. They have a really good defense and they're good enough on offense and as we'll talk about, the division is <laughs> wide open. Why not Illinois? It's a good team. Yeah, I, I think they have every opportunity to be involved, particularly after the big win on the road. And it, it's, yes, it, we may find out this is a Badger team that's obviously not as, as good as they, we normally see them. But I think this is really more about this Illinois football team and what they've been able to do on the defensive side. Walters has done an unbelievable job on that side. What DeVito has been able to do at the quarterback position, Chase Brown running the football. I mean, they have really put themselves in a great position to make a run. And I think that's the biggest thing that you, Illinois fans need to be excited about. They're in the mix without a doubt. Oh, absolutely. And they played so consistently well. I think that's that's where when you look at these rankings of, you know, third in total defense in the country, yeah. second in rushing for Chase Brown in the country. I mean, they're not just doing this at a, oh, this is a nice level for, yeah. for the Big Ten West. <laughs> like, this is so consistently and so sound now through five, five weeks um, that you have to believe. And I, I will say, I don't want to jinx them like we did all of last week with Minnesota <laughs> yeah, because we, we did say, them. oh, well, yeah. this is the favorite of the West. Yeah. So maybe not going to say that they're like, like the clear cut favorite because right, that may right. be a jinx, but no, there's absolutely no reason. And you absolutely, if you look at the Big Ten in tiers and you put like Ohio State of Michigan up here mm -hmm. and maybe Penn State, they're in that next tier. I mean, they are playing really, really well. And I think they're ahead of schedule for Brett Bielema, although maybe, you know, he's so good in this division, yeah. maybe there really isn't a schedule. 
I mean, to your point, they're first in the nation in scoring defense. They're first in the nation in pass efficiency defense. They're first in the Big Ten in rushing defense. You have the best pass efficiency defense in the nation Mm -hmm. and the best rushing defense in your league. That is a pretty good combination. This is a huge litmus test this week because we talk about how much they've struggled in Madison historically. Iowa's won eight in a row against them, 13 of 14. Mm -hmm. This is a program that has dominated them. So, So we'll see. This is an opportunity for me. And I think the other thing that's really interesting when you talk about Coach Bieleman being the head coach, right? He allows his offensive coordinator and defensive coordinators to coach. He oversees everything that's got to go on in the program, and he knows everything that's going on. But he allows his coordinators to coordinate, and it shows up. I mean, just look at the scene of the players. You see how they embrace him as well. I don't know. His back's probably killing him today. They were beating on him so bad trying to congratulate him. (laughs) But but I I think it speaks volumes. And I think we all would have agreed when that hire was made that he was going to get this thing turned around quicker than probably most people thought it would happen. That was a great hire. There's no question. In fact, it was a hire that we had yeah. talked about <laughs> hypothetically yeah. sitting in our green room. Who could get it done yeah. there? His name was mentioned yeah. very, very prominently. Is Obviously, it, it's a perfect fit mm-hmm. given uh, his connections in, in the Big Ten West and, and given his uh, the fact that he grew up in the state of Illinois. He, he's just been tremendous. So, again, Iowa this week, Minnesota after that. We'll see where they stack up in the West. Yeah. Minnesota, uh, speaking of the West, the other eyebrow raiser this yeah. week was Purdue beating the Gophers. No Mo Ibrahim. I think yeah. we understand how important he is to Minnesota. That being said, though, wow. I mean, I, I think to your point and to my point earlier, yeah. I think we had all kind of said, hey, Minnesota's, yeah. they're the team, and they've been so dominant early on. What happened here? Yeah, well, it, it, it was just did not look like the Minnesota that we had seen for – the previous weeks yeah. um, you know it looked like the Chris Altman Bell injury got caught up mm-hmm. to them as well as Mo because you just didn't have these weapons or options and Tanner Morgan obviously career high three interceptions just all the things that we were so not used to seeing yeah. out of this Minnesota offense what was a problem and then Purdue ran the ball so well against them and we it was the last time we've talked about <laughs> Purdue's rushing attack over the years. I mean, if they had run the ball a couple times against Penn State, they Mm -hmm. win that in week one. But now they can really run the ball. And, man, they just gashed Minnesota's run defense, too. I mean, there were just so many areas that we thought Minnesota was consistent and secure in that they just were not able to do in this game. But, again, I think it starts with losing multiple offensive weapons. You saw all the things we talked about in the preseason about replacing offensive linemen. Mm -hmm. Everything that could possibly be a concern was a concern on Saturday. P.J. Flex said from the podium after the game, you know, we hadn't faced diversity. Well, now we have, right? right? There were plays. We didn't make enough plays to win the football game. One of those interceptions is a touchdown. Goes off the receiver's hands. They had made those plays in previous weeks. Now they have to get back to the drawing board, and I'm sure he's saying to those guys, well, I guess we're not as good as we thought, huh? I guess we're going to have to work a little bit harder this week to, to be able to make sure that they shore up those plays. But it was amazing to just see the way Tanner was playing throughout the game because it wasn't just that one interception. There were obviously there were two others. And, but it, things just did not seem in rhythm yeah. for that team at all uh, the entire game. And, you know, that's one of the things that starts to happen to you. You know, it's interesting, kind of to your point about the injuries, last year was just kind of plug in the next running back and you go, right? They had five different players rush for – 100 yards in a game Mm -hmm. last year, which is a a staggering number. They had a couple guys transfer out, which is normal in this day and age because guys are saying, well, I'm I'm the fourth guy, and look, I ran for 100 yards, and I'm a good player. And and so, and I think that part of it might have been that. Uh, It's interesting to look at it from Purdue's point of view. I mean, if you would have told me before the game, Aiden O'Connell was going to throw for less than 200 yards, was not going to throw a touchdown pass, and was going to throw for two picks, Mm -hmm. I'd say they lose. I mean, but... To your point, Nicole, the running game, Devin Mockaby, who is a yeah. walk-on who's yep. going to Navy, yep. and ends up rushing for 100 Jeff yards. Brom loves his walk-on. Like, yeah. He always yeah. gives us these great stories of yeah. these former walk-ons. Yeah. But that, it's, it's impressive, right, that we've seen them get better, and we, we know that that's been an important focus, that Jeff Brom wants to be able to run the ball, and that's something that they do. You, you could argue Purdue should be undefeated right now, and they've endured the Aiden O'Connell Two plays injury. away. Yeah. Two plays, less than a minute in each of those yep. games that they lost those two games. So it's funny because entering the season, I thought 
Purdue could win the West. I thought it was pretty wide open, more wide open than maybe, you know, you always love that preseason poll where people mm -hmm. thought Wisconsin yeah. was yeah, going to yeah. win the 31 to 36. Right. The writers, yeah. so the writers who cover this league thought Wisconsin was going right. to win the league. And I was like, you know, Purdue's schedule, Minnesota's schedule, and maybe it's more wide open than it is. Purdue's in that mix, too. I mean, this is a team that I think could could have been undefeated this year. And even when they, you know, Aiden O'Connell wasn't on his A game, now they have a, now they have a rushing attack. Yeah. They're uh, interesting. And they're going to have to continue to, to use that rushing attack as well because I don't know that, that Aiden's 100%. At least he didn't necessarily yeah, didn't look play. 100% in that game, and they needed to run the football to be able to have success. The other thing I thought they cleaned up in that game was a lot of the penalties that they've been having in previous weeks that was really hurting them as well, particularly at the time they would get those penalties. But this Purdue team has really become one of those teams that you, you really you don't know what you're going to get, right? You just don't know. Um, and they just have to get back to a more consistent uh, way of playing the game. You know, they had to change it up two weeks ago because of the quarterback situation, the way they call the game. But we've seen them be, be able to make plays. And uh, Coach English, you know, she wanted to shut down the run of Minnesota. They shut down the run and made them one-dimensional. And now we've seen that if you can make Minnesota one-dimensional, that makes that puts more stress on the passing game. They held them 248 yards under their rushing average. I would say they, they definitely <laughs> made them one-dimensional. So now the Big Ten West is officially clear as mud. Uh, I mean, we have no idea what's going on. You look at the standings in that division. You have six teams now. At one and one, Wisconsin at zero oh and two, the team wow. that, that everyone picked in, in the preseason. Look at that! Look at that! I, it is it is officially crazy. Is it as wide open as that would imply, Nicole, or do you think that there are some teams that are separating themselves even amidst the chaos of everyone essentially being the same? Yeah, I mean, I think has one win in the Big Ten, and it was over Nebraska, but I don't think that you would necessarily say, like, Northwestern is going to win the West. Right. Um, so I do, I do think there's the, the Same teams. with Nebraska, probably, right? Yeah, like, yeah. there are the teams that, um, that I think we've seen multiple weeks out of. You know, we've seen enough from an Illinois that we know that they have on both sides of the ball enough to do this. Iowa, we still have a lot of questions about what they can do offensively, but the defense is good enough, so they'll stay in the mix. What's interesting is this type of Big Ten West is exactly the type of Big Ten West where Wisconsin usually just destroys everybody. Yeah. Like, how many seasons have we seen that where, like, the, beyond them, everyone mm -hmm. was kind of very similar and in, in, in this, you know, the, the top to the bottom was pretty close. But now they're in the thick of that. Um, and so, again, I, I don't think Minnesota's going to go away here. We'll, you know, we've got to learn more about Moe's injury. Yeah. But Illinois has got a good shot. Iowa, I really don't think you can ever count them out. Like, there are going to be those teams that are going to stay in the mix here. Purdue, I think, should be in that mix. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, like, Northwestern and Nebraska, you know, some of those teams I think will fall off. And you saw the overall records for some of those teams. But there will be, what, three or four contenders, I think, in the West into November? That would be my prediction. Yeah, I think you look at Illinois, you look at Purdue, you look at Minnesota right now as as they're playing now and either those teams can win and as you mentioned Iowa you never know you they never may, know how those you never know how their their good their season is going to continue to unfold but when you see a, a Minnesota team that's a team you probably think okay yeah they they stub their toe but you think they'll be able to figure out we'll learn a lot about them once again this week how they respond but Illinois is playing so well. Purdue can throw it all over the place when they when they get hot. So there are some teams out there that I think it's it's really wide open to have an opportunity to to really push through and, and maybe have a chance to get to Indy. I'm fascinated by it. I, I think it's going to be really really interesting. And I, I agree with the teams that yeah. you guys highlighted. But that's a lot of teams, <laughs> right? I mean, we're not talking about well, it's between these two, right? <laughs> Which is good. Yeah, right? no. I, I think it is. I think it's fun. Yeah, and yeah. It, it adds drama. It's it's going to be very interesting. There'll be a lot of really important games. Our big stat is brought to you by Gatorade. The Big Ten continuing to showcase some of the nation's top defenses. How about five of the top ten in the nation in total? D. Minnesota and Illinois are two and three. Michigan, Iowa, Ohio State also in the top ten. Uh, we had wondered about the Buckeyes defense in the preseason. Howard, Jim <laughs> Knowles, at least by that measure, yeah. doing a really nice job. What do you make of Ohio State coming off the, the game against Rutgers? You know, I think they're continuing to, to be on schedule as far as this defense is concerned. They're playing much better, obviously, than they had in previous years. And even going back to the first part of the year, they've continued to improve. And to me, the part that stands out is just those is 
part of it is the linebacker group. Their, their ability to run and diagnose plays and make the plays they need to has really been significant. They do a great job of timing up blitzes, and that's really helped as far as being able to put pressure on their opposing teams. I mean, so many times last year they looked slow. You know, we, we did see some of those missed tackles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, uh, the pressure on the line wasn't there, like in the way that we've seen it in recent years. Those things are back, and those are important hallmarks, I think, for this Buckeye defense. And so you see it showing up, and obviously the big test will be Michigan at the end of the year. That's right. the one that this <laughs> yeah. is all geared that, towards. Yeah, that, that uh, tends to be an important game. Yeah, <laughs> but, but they're doing all the things that we wanted to see them do as they get closer and closer to that test. Leading the Big Ten in tackles for loss, kind of mm -hmm. to your guys' point, Steel Chambers was fantastic yes. this weekend. Tommy Eichenberg's having yep. a really good Two year. Two weeks ago, he was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. he was great. He was unbelievable. Yeah. Got so Michigan State yeah. this week, not a game that, that looms as large as it seemed like it might a, a few weeks ago, yeah. again, as you mentioned. that it, it does seem to all focus on, on the game against the Wolverines, although we got, uh, we got Penn State in yeah. there as yeah. well. That's, that's going to be a, a pretty big one, and we'll talk about the Nittany Lions here in a bit. Uh, we got all worked up all week about Michigan, and they were going to Kinnick Stadium, and this is where top five teams go to die and all that. And it really never seemed like they were in jeopardy. That was a good performance. Really solid. Um, I thought dominant was a word. Even when they were settling for the field goals and mm -hmm. having trouble finishing some of those drives, I just thought they were dominant. Um, J.J. McCarthy, we wanted to see how he would handle that yep. environment. Looked really good. Michigan's offense moved with ease. I mean, not ease. I mean, ease was like Hawaii, right? This, But they moved that ball well. They did what they wanted to do. Um, I just thought really impressive defensively as well. Just a really solid team. I, we've been waiting to learn about Michigan, and I think they checked off a lot of boxes for a lot of people, but especially J.J. and the way that he handled that environment and, and maneuvered that offense up and down the field, even though they did stall out sometimes. I thought there were a couple plays that really stood out for me as the offense, and you're talking about J.J. making decisions. He scrambled out to the right as a broken play. He finds Edwards in the back of the end zone for the touchdown because he's scrambling, still trying to make a play down the field. And those two are get on, they're on the same page, and it turns into a scramble drill, and it turns into a touchdown. Makes a great play. The other play is Quorum. The offensive line does an unbelievable job of blocking, getting him to the second level. He's got Campbell, one of the best linebackers in the country, and he made one move, and it was like Campbell wasn't there anymore. And he took it in for a touchdown. So you're seeing the playmakers and the growth of this team right now they're continuing to grow and this is you know we've been saying this now for a couple of weeks You're talking about just having to go into hostile environments they've proven it each and every week they're checking off a box and it'll be another one this week that they have to continue to get better with it was it was remarkable they didn't turn the ball over i mean this is yeah. a defense yeah. that forces everybody to do mm -hmm. that and you have a you know a, a quarterback who's brand new to the starting position they t they took care of the ball really well and you know we joked right you know is Indi does does Iowa have a chance if their defense scores points which mm -hmm. they they've done a great job of this season but to not even give them that opportunity i thought yeah. was really important to take care of the ball the way they did yep no turnovers just three tackles for loss allowed so kind of all of the hallmarks of the the ways that you lose yes. at Kinnick Stadium, they didn't allow any of that to happen, didn't allow the Hawkeyes to, to pick up any momentum. Michigan goes to Indiana next mm -hmm. week, and then the big showdown with Penn State, so the first of those kind of big. mammoth games. For and them. Indiana always plays Michigan tough. Yeah, well, they beat them a couple yeah. years ago. They put up a fight. Yeah, yeah. Right. Indiana doesn't have a great track record against true. top five teams. Yeah, yes. but they're, they're going to they're, they're not going to lay down. <laughs> at least, at least Jim Harbaugh gave us that quote, though. I mean, we can use it every year. Yes, <laughs> top we can. five teams yes, go to die. Go to die. <laughs> yeah, come on. Yes, uh, no doubt. It, it is never too early to start planning your Saturday. We'll be talking about <laughs> that game and, and many others. Hope you'll spend some of it with us, all Big Ten, all morning long. It is time for our overreaction Monday on Big Ten today. We mentioned Penn State a little bit earlier. Let's start there. They slogged it out. Really bad weather game against Northwestern. The two teams combined for eight turnovers. Penn State had five of them. Five <laughs> turnovers. Now, they didn't give up any points off the turnovers, so give them a, a ton of credit there. But should we be concerned that a team that had turned it over once all year turned it over five times? I don't think so. I mean, I, I get that the wanting to overreact to this and, and listen, like Penn State has been playing so well. So many things mm -hmm. have been going right for them. But that that, that was a monsoon. I, I have such a hard time holding really anything, <laughs> anyone accountable for things yeah. that happened in that game. It looked miserable. I couldn't believe that there were fans in those in those seats for the whole game. I mean, yeah. it was incredible. So I get the concern if it carries over into a different game. Absolutely valid point. 
Um, but I just think a lot of the statistics from that game, you just have to put a little asterisk and say monsoon. Yeah, I think one of the things that's a little concerning is it was coming from the running back group as well. Uh, and they've got to be able to hold on to the ball. Young players playing in that type of situation. Yeah. They've got to take care of the ball. And I think Coach Franklin will be preaching that once again this week. Because that's not, when we talk about this team, you know, taking that next step and continuing to push to, you know, to fight for, to win the East, they can't have games like this. And this is not where you want to see them playing. And yes, the weather conditions are a part of it, but the self-inflicted wounds, you can't, you can't have that. And, and I think that's part of what they'll have to, you know, try to get cleaned up and in a hurry. And honestly, Sean Clifford threw uh, one, another one that should have been a pick yeah. that went, I mean, mm-hmm. right through right. A, a defensive back's yeah. hand. So very easily could have been six. And to your point, it was, there were some good hits. I mean, yeah. give Northwestern some, some credit. There were some really good hits on those running backs. Now, you know, they still went for 220 rushing yards. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a real positive for Penn State because we have talked about their run game issues. And, and so now we're talking about four straight games over 150. A Maryland and Michigan State, the Terps win by two touchdowns. Let's start with Maryland. I do want to touch on Michigan State a little bit, but let's start with Maryland. I mean, we're talking about Michigan and Ohio State and then Penn State. I mean, should we be talking about Maryland somewhere in that East race? Maryland is really good. <laughs> we, I feel like we talk about this every week, how much we enjoy yeah. watching what they're doing offensively. Uh, we, we also always end up talking about it's a different running back or a different receiver that breaks out. They've mm-hmm. got a lot of weapons and a lot of talent. I also think the defense has improved yes. significantly this season, and, and maybe that's not getting enough t- attention. But these are the types of games that Mi- Maryland – hadn't won, right? Like the games that are as they Mm -hmm. inch up through those Big Ten East standings. Um, So I don't know if I'm going to put them in the category of Michigan, Ohio State, but they're absolutely, in my mind, with like Illinois and in that grouping of like, these are the next best teams in the league, and they've shown us enough. They've been consistent enough where in past seasons we'd see it in non-conference play, but it didn't carry over. It is carrying over. You're seeing it, and you go back to even to that Michigan game, right? The yeah, one score they, game. Yes, one score game, and they were playing really well, uh, and they were over were able to overcome some things. But when this offense starts to hum in the way that yeah. that it can, uh, this is a tough team to stop. When you look at that receiving core, really unbelievable talent in that room, and now they're running the ball with some consistency with different guys as well. Defense is going to be, I think, the ultimate key as they start to make that that move up the ladder because they're going to be there. We've known they've been able to do things offensively, but now defensively they're starting to have a big say of what's going on. That's a fascinating game against Purdue. I mean, if you win that game, your next couple are Indiana and Northwestern, who you match up pretty well against. I mean, we could start seeing Maryland putting yeah. together some, some wins here and at least mathematically very much being in that Been conversation. Up. What do you make of Michigan State, Howard? It's, it's a few weeks in a row now. Yeah. I mean, they were certainly more competitive in, in this mm-hmm. game than, than they had been in the previous couple, but not by a whole lot. Yeah, we, I mean, it, well, we've seen them make yeah. the same mistakes, though, right? Yeah. They haven't been able to, to have that consistency on the ground. They've struggled a little bit to take care of the, to protect the quarterback, and the quarterback has had his issues. So defensively, we know who they are defensively right now. They're going to give up plays on that side, and offensively is where – they need to, to, to really get back and make the jump to really hide some of those deficiencies on the defensive side. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're going to have to win shootouts, and I think they know that, and that's a lot on Peyton Thorne. Yeah. Um, you know, and he's getting some of his guys back, and it's going to help, but, you know, he's going to have to have some pretty perfect games. They've given up 41 plays of 10 yards or longer in the last two games. It's crazy. Uh, it's, two games. It's a lot, yes. Yeah. 41 so plays. They're seven. not in the top 10, uh, like all the other defenses in the Big <laughs> 10. I don't think so. They're they're not not there. So. Uh, how about Nebraska? This was a we, we talked a lot on tailgate about this was an important game because both of these teams felt like they'd come in and, and would have a chance to win, right? Uh, Nebraska gets the win. Mickey Joseph gets his first win as, as the interim head coach. Yeah. They had a week off to kind of lick their wounds and collect themselves. What does this win mean for Nebraska, again, in a division where it's, it's up for grabs? Yeah, this could be momentum. I mean, that would be the overreaction, right, mm-hmm. is that this is the start of something. Talked about when you make a change so early, you really do have time for that coach to build something. Mm-hmm. He's made staffing changes. Yeah. He did what they needed to do. Um, I, I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to say, sure, that there could be momentum there and that there's plenty of time for Nebraska to turn things around. That's why you made the change. You felt yeah. like it wasn't fair to the players right. to keep doing the same thing, making the same mistakes week in and week out. So let's see if something's different. This was the first time in a long time we've seen a Nebraska team face some adversity, be right in the middle of the game, 
and be able to overcome said adversity. Yes. Normally, we'd sit in the green room and it's like, ah, here we go again, <laughs> right? Here we go. But, but the players, like players are, they're resilient because it's a new coaching staff, really, uh, to some degree being led uh, by a new head coach. But they believed. And that was kind of what we were talking about, really, even going back to last year. They needed some good things to happen for them the ball to bounce the right way, to be able to make plays when their backs were against the wall. And that's what we saw happen, and we hadn't seen that in previous they, really years. They also have to believe they can win those games because I feel like so many times we saw those Nebraska teams get into a tight game, even mm -hmm. with leads, right? They would blow a lead and it would get tight, and you just knew that they didn't yep. think that they could actually pull it off. So to see them actually do this, get a W, yeah. That was, I think that was big. And to do it with a unit that had struggled so mightily this year. I mean, the defense won them the game and give up five yards in the fourth quarter. And we know how bad the defense is. <laughs> and was. the head coach made a change yes. the defensive, yep. running the defense. Like, yeah. that is a, a major decision for an interim head coach. Absolutely, yes. And at least the very early returns tell us that paid off. We'll right. see this week, Rutgers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's another one where both teams come in feeling yeah. like got a chance to win it. Got that a game, a, a Friday night game.